Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Eric Coleman with IIST and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Is the world not flat? A view of offshoring versus agile in a cost obsessed world where quality really might not matter by Michael Ma. We're excited you're able to join us today. Set aside an hour to attend this webinar. This webinar is one of a series of free webinars to introduce the topics as well as the presenters of the upcoming SUTM conference in San Diego, California, September 13th through the 18th at the Sheraton San Diego Hotel and Marina. The conference focuses on advancing the test management and quality management professions by providing practical methods based on best practices. The ongoing theme of the conference, practical, proven, feasible, keeps the focus on what works. To view the conference program and more information, visit www.qualitymanagementconference.com. Be sure to join us for the next webinar in this series, Innovative Thinking, Evolve and Expand Your Com Compatibilities by J Jennifer Bonin on August 28th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. To learn more about this and other webinars in the series, go to www.qualitymanagementconference.com. You may submit your questions at any time by using your question box in your GoToWebinar window. Today's presenter will answer as many questions within the time allowed at the end of today's session. This webinar is also being recorded and will be made available for viewing within 48 hours at www.qualitymanagementconference.com. At the end of today's webinar, you will be asked to complete a short survey. At IIST, we strive to provide the highest quality educational resources for the public and would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete this short survey. I will now turn the webinar over to today's presenter, Michael Ma. Michael? Thank you very much, Eric, and happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. It's a privilege to have an opportunity to share an exciting talk that I have for you today. Um, and it comes from a, a stance of an observer uh, over 25 years of me witnessing, bearing witness to what we see in the industry of part of our research. Uh, I am part of two organizations. I wear two hats. I'm the benchmark practice director of a Boston-based think tank called Cutter Consortium. And I'm an author, uh, former editor of the IT Metric Strategies publication. And the other world that I live in is a managing partner of a wonderful organization called Quantitative Software Management. Uh, so think about the words in that name. We manage software by the numbers. We've been studying software patterns for a couple of decades, and we've been collecting data and statistics on completed software projects for that entire time. We're very well known for being the inventors and the authors of a software model a suite of tools that deal with measurement, estimation, and forecasting software. And today's talk is going to be a uh, case study, uh, two case studies actually. And it's been the keynote speech in Europe as well as Central America, uh, Far East. And I'm also looking forward to being the keynote speaker at the uh, San Diego conference. So I hope to see you there up and say hello. Great. Okay, so you got a big bug and that's where I left off. I, let's talk about quality and let's talk about bugs from a, for a moment. And I said that my early introduction or indoctrination into the world of software defect patterns, uh, bug rates happened while I was part of a design team on the navigation system for the Trident nuclear submarine program. Um, we discovered, along with a number of other researchers in the industry at the time, that the occurrence of bugs in code from the engineering life cycle from left to right on a timeline seemed to follow a Rayleigh curve. Uh, defects rates would build up to a peak and then experience a long tail. And the size of that peak and the duration of that tail was uh, a consequence of a couple of factors, the experience of the team, the domain knowledge, the complexity of what we were building, and the engineering processes. So we've been collecting data in the QSM SLIM database for years now on defect curve behavior patterns. And that's what the two case studies that I have today are going to be talking about when we contrast agile methods uh, versus offshoring and distributed teams. So this is a photo of a Trident II nuclear submarine underway along the surface, um, undergoing its mission to just secretly protect the United States. Back in the day, that was the idea. This is the control console that our engineering team 
uh, worked on. This is the NCC, the Navigation Control Console. And one thing about the Trud submarine was how software intensive it was. And it was one of its kind. And we studied very acutely the kinds of patterns of how software project behavior uh, was exhibiting as we were building uh, the application for this very sophisticated machine. Uh, today, I fly something much more simple that doesn't have any software as pilot. Uh, I like to fly Piper Cubs, and uh, these are the instruments quite in contrast to a nuclear submarine. No software. This doesn't even have a battery. You have to hand spin the prop. So from time to time, I might use some aviation analogies, engineering analogies, as I talk about this case study about what we see from industry research on software quality. So let's go ahead and move on, uh, talk about the database. Uh, right now, about 12,000 completed projects in our research database, which we are able to place the productivity statistics from that research right on the desktop of people who use these models. Um, and the context of being able to talk to today's two case studies, Agile versus outsourcing, is because data has been streaming into our library for years, and we get to be first witness to understand what the patterns are. So this database contains projects in all industries, waterfall, Agile, offshore, outsourced, in-house, uh, uh, overseas development, new application development, as well as maintenance and model the behavior of these projects uh, using a model called SLIM, or Software Lifecycle Management. So that's the context of where this information came from. We get data from all over the world, from the world's leading producers of software, and uh, it winds up being part of our understanding. One of the companies that we came across when we were experiencing the unfolding of Agile uh, in our industry was a company that agreed to be named. They're called Follett Software, based out of the Chicago area, McHenry, Illinois. And they are like the Amazon.com of educational uh, materials for the classrooms K through 12, as well as universities. So if you need materials for your school district or books uh, for your incoming freshmen, chances are it goes through the Follett portal. And a number of years ago, I was asked to measure and benchmark uh, what they were seeing from their Agile um, uh, process, which they said was a straight classic XP drinking the Kent made Kool-Aid Kool uh, right out of the bottle, uh, pair programmers, co-located developers, um, people working with client proxies, uh, two-week sprints, the whole works. So um, this is a series of photographs of what this world looks like in their development environment. One large room, everybody working together. That's a gentleman named Brian Smith, who's one of the development managers. Uh, it was a noisy place, even a ping pong table in the background there. Uh, which was intended for people to just online, sometimes could create distractions. So they learned a lot about how to put soundproofing materials on walls and things like that. Another thing that I noticed walking around with my camera were photographs of family right under their screens. And I asked about this and I said, what's going on with so many photographs of children all in the workspace. And they said, well, one of the things that we adhere to with the XP process is a 40-hour work week. And in the old culture, when it was considered to be good to be a team player and work overtime and burn out working 50, 60 hours, uh, in this new way of thinking, we're told to go home. Go home to your children, help them with their homework, uh, prepare them for the next day at school. After all, we're an education oriented company. Our mission is to ignite minds of children. So uh, that was an interesting cultural observation I saw there. We collected data on their releases, six of them during this engagement, pardon the bad photograph, I didn't have an iPhone at the time, of uh, taking a sketch of the story work phase in the blue uh, over a period of five months with two people going left to right through January, March, April, May, June, 
And then the build phase, or the sprints, 14 sprints or iterations, began with 20 people, went for three months, January, February, March, and then kicked up to 20 people as they went for another one, two, three and a half months of testing. And so to capture data on this Agile release and five others, we drew pictures like this. And this is what I teach organizations, how to capture uh, project profiles, whether, whether it's Agile or outsourced, uh, on a board and capture the duration of the release for the build and test, in this case six months the number of developers and testers, which went between 20 and 26 people, building a total of about 83 stories in the backlog, representing 250 story points, um, and to provide the working software that made that functionality in stories and story points was about 120,000 changed lines of code and a similar amount of new added lines of code to produce that story functionality. And the defects during testing, during regression testing, we captured that. They said, well, we think it's about 200 bugs found during regression, which you see on the right side of that red block. Uh, when we double checked the numbers and actually took out the duplicates, it turned out to be 121. So when we benchmarked this Agile release, we wanted to answer the question that Kent Beck's hypothesis claimed would happen with quality on Agile development with co-located pe co people working in pairs. He said, number one, the bug rate should come way down. So our question was, if there were 121 bugs found and fixed during regression, is that much Fewer than industry average? Is it right on the middle of the curve, the 50th percentile of industry average? Or is it higher above industry average? What is industry average from the QSM database? Secondly, when they finished this backlog of work of 83 stories and 250 story points in six months, is six months slower or six months faster than the industry average? What's the real truth here? If we want to have a fact-based conversation about quality, switching to Agile, uh, compared to what the rest of the world is experiencing. So we dropped this information very quickly from the whiteboard sketch into a data record in our software lifecycle management data file. Uh, we record all of the start and finish, the number of people, the total amount of stories in the code, and the bug rates. And then we are off to the races to benchmark. And I'm going to also do a contrasting similar case study on an outsourced project uh, after we look at what we found here. So we recreated this slim model, drew a you know, digital uh, version of what we did on the whiteboard sketch. It's a lot cleaner than my scratchy uh, handwriting. And then we plot it on a chart. So I'm going to explain to you what this chart is, and after one run through of this trend line, you will understand how to read whether data is above or below industry average on future trend lines. So that one release that I just showed you, release 5.0, is one of the smaller of the six releases. It's on the left-hand side of the chart in terms of story, story points, or code, new and change code. And it's that red dot for the number of defects, 121, found and fixed during testing. The QSM database of what we see in industry is this solid black line that you see going left to right, rising as systems go from small to medium to large. The next thing that we could do, we could say that 121 is that above or below the black line and by how much? And the quick answer is, Industry average for this amount of software in the backlog of this release was about twice that. So typically, there should have been about 240 busts in the code, and Follett's code was half. Now, is this a fluke? Is it a one-time deal? And when we look at release 6, release 7.5, 7.0, 8.0, 6.5, we see similarly all five of those projects are also below the QSM center average. 
In fact, they start getting towards that lower hashed line, which is the upper 84th percentile of peers. So think of an SAT score. The further down you go, the higher up you get in terms of your SAT percentile. I'm in the 85th percentile compared to all other students out there doing math. Well, these folks were 50 to 60 percent fewer defects in industry, and they were approaching the 80th percentile in terms of being clean code and quality. What about schedule? How fast were they? They were twice as fast. So that 5.0 release that finished in six months, uh, the industry average was actually 10 months. And the team said, wait, so that means that not only were we four months faster than industry in our agile implementation, pair programming, co-located teams, but we actually were twice as fast and one half the number of bugs? And the answer is yes. Now, is this a one-time fluke? No. When we look at all other five releases going all the way across, again, they're about twice as fast. So this was a repeated phenomena that we saw that told their CFO and their CIO conclusively what were the metrics, what were the fact-based conversations that we could have about our Agile performance. Now, someone say, well, how about the team size? When they use 20, 25 people, maybe they're that fast because they're using double the headcount. No. Actually, we're using exactly the industry average number of developers and testers across the board. It was, they were hugging the center line on all of their releases. So normal staffing, twice as fast, half the defects. And we put this together on one slide because they said, Michael, when you come in and do the executive committee briefing, which will be the five top uh, executives of our company, what can you say in one slide? So I put this together. I said, in terms of industry average, where it would typically take 3.5 million to build, you are doing it in 2.2 million. That means you're 1.3 million cheaper. And instead of 12 and a half months when you include the requirements phase or the story phase, you're pulling it off in 7.8, which is, including the requirements phase, almost five months faster, 1.3 million cheaper. Now, on top of that, the code is really clean. Half the number of bugs are in the code compared to industry average, which might explain why your testing is completed sooner. And your headcount is typical, on average, about 35 people. Now think about this from a quality standpoint. Jim Highsmith, who is one of the signers of the Agile Manifesto and the director of the Agile practice at Cutter, while I was the director of the benchmarking practice at Cutter, said that one of the things that we do with Agile is we stand on it on its head. We shoot for quality by building clean code with people pairing in short bursts, and as a result, we get schedule. And that's what happened here, and it was proved out in the metrics, definitively with hard numbers. In the old days of waterfall, or maybe even offshoring, we shot for schedule first. So we would throw a lot of people on a project to try to compress the date, and then we would wait to see what happened with quality. And that my friends, is what we're going to be talking about in the next case study. But before I get to that, let's talk about some lessons learned. What did we see here from a quality perspective on the practices that resulted in the code quality being twice as good? Well, short feedback loops. When you have pair programmers sitting side by side, you don't have to wait for an answer, an email or a phone call if you have a question you immediately are having two sets of eyes looking at the code at the same time. I think of it too when I fly an airplane, I feel like we are far better pilots when I'm either the co-pilot for my friend Bob, if he's in the left seat flying our Piper Cherokee, or if I'm the pilot and he's the co-pilot. Because you know, people are human, we miss things, we might make mistakes, there have been times that I've made accidental calls on a radio and misannounced my position, and Bob would say, 
by the way, we're actually coming into GBR Airport and you accidentally said PSF, Pittsfield, on the downwind leg coming in for landing. And if I didn't catch that, I could wind up risking a collision with another inbound plane because they think I'm miles away when in fact I'm right in the down, downwind leg about to turn to final and, and then uh, for landing. So you have two people here sitting at the same place, short feedback loops. Uh, also, in accelerated learning and execution, we learn from each other. It's like we're mutually coaching each other. Face-to-face -face communication channel from those very short feedback loops. Time boxing is remarkable because it chunks things into clear, discernible targets, and then we look at clear, discernible limits and don't try to take on too much with each sprint. Avoiding burnout. You saw that uh, people were told to go home and not work the long hours that they used to. My friend Tim Lister was the author of the book People Wear and uh, another, a number of other software engineering books said a tired mind is an uncreative and a less useful mind. You can't be sharp and creative when you're exhausted and I'm sure a lot of you would agree. Transparency. Ken Schwaber, who is the, quote, inventor of Scrum, uh, when he was a keynote speaker at an Agile conference, he said, I love this phrase, transparency is a great floodlight. People who thrive in political maneuvering hate Scrum. And when we have everything sh directly out on boards, uh, every sprint is visible. We have daily stand-up meetings and release planning meetings and iterations. That works its way into quality and the good. Nothing goes underground. And finally, when we're talking about uh, short feedback loops, we have very high bandwidth communications. Uh, the best teams have wide open pipes through which knowledge can flow, and that makes clean code. Avoiding waste and costly rework. If we catch it early, we don't let something uh, hang in there late. And this is really, uh, and I won't dwell on this, genius man Norbert Wiener too, too long, but he was a, a genius mathematician uh, born in 1894, uh, died in 1964. He got his undergraduate degree at my alma mater, Tufts University, but he did it at 14. And then he graduated from Harvard University at 18. Uh, and then he went on to teach at MIT. And Norbert Wiener is considered the father of uh, information theory, the father of cybernetics, and the ideas about feedback loops. And he talked about the feedback principle being a key feature of life forms, from simplest plants to most complex animals, which change their reactions quickly in response to their environment. So feedback control systems, all of the things that stabilize the planet, uh, information theory, your thermostat in your house, your cruise control in your car, it's all about feedback in this theory of cybernetics. So I urge you to Google that and you're going to find that this whole idea about short feedback loops in Agile works its way into the code and results in clean code because of a lot of theories of information management that were originally espoused by Norbert Wiener. Okay, case study number two, as we go into the rounding home stretch here and then take your questions, is a client that I got to meet when they had a large outsourcing project uh, in the blue and the green phase of the work for the concept design and the requirements that was going to be done in Raleigh, North Carolina, and then they were going to hand off uh, the work to a large team in Mumbai, India, which would ramp up aggressively from seven to 30, to 79, to 95 people in a burst of fury to get this work done. And this was something in the digital uh, patient management uh, information, digital uh, medical records. Okay, so the idea was to be able to take all those giant files in doctors and hospitals office and put it uh, electronically in a computer system, which you're probably even more familiar with now as you see what's happening in medical care. Now this was a case where the CFO said outsource everything to India. Cost is what we care about. So if we can buy talent at uh, you know 
70 cents, 60 cents on the dollar, 50 cents on the dollar in India, then do it and get all the work offshore. Now, what did we see in this project? Let's take a look. We put this information to SLIM by putting in the amount of functionality that they were aiming for in the backlog in a very aggressive time frame with 95 people trying to get this done. And we put the, this project against the QSM trends after creating it digitally inside our SLIM model. So this is the recreation of the whiteboard sketch and it's got much cleaner view than my scribble. And the first thing I want to look at um, is what schedule was this organization shooting for? Now this actually is a sketch of their plan. Unlike the Follett case study, we did not get their actual after the fact. This was at the beginning of the timeline, not the end. But we wanted to benchmark their plan. How aggressive was it? So in terms of schedule, this release plotted like this along with two other releases that they sketched out with me from their estimates and their spreadsheets. This release was AB 9.5, which is right in the middle there. They were aiming for about 14 months. It was about 800,000 lines of code. It was a huge amount of backlog that they were trying to do in a very short period of time. And they threw the army of people at it, 95 people. Um, they also had another release to the left and to the right of that, and their schedules were plotted against the trend line of history to see how aggressive those were. Now, the one on the left is pretty darn aggressive, but it's inside a cluster of previously completed projects, which you see in blue squares and, say, you know, brown circles. But the other two were off the chart in terms of precedence. They not only the largest releases that the company was trying to take on in its history, but they were trying to shoot for the fastest speed ever seen. And in some companies, they refer to this region on that lower right as the impossible zone. Why would we call it the impossible zone? Well, it's because it's where historically no project has ever been found. No project has ever been gone before. So they're going for the impossible zone by throwing huge amounts of people in it. Let's take a look at their staffing. And indeed, the staffing, in terms of headcount, 80, 90, 100 people on that release 10, 200 people were completely off the chart, way up there compared to their own history, their own trend that we created for them in the slim trend line. Now, I'll pause for a minute and I'll ask you a question. If I double staff, and I try to compress schedule. Do you think bugs go down? Or do you think bugs go up? And I can't see by a show of hands. I'm going to bet that you think bugs go up. So if I throw 100 people on a project instead of 50, bugs aren't going to go down. They're going to go up. The next part of this mini quiz that relates to quality is if I double staff and I get a schedule compression, how much faster does a 10-month project actually come in compared to its original target? Do I think I cut the schedule in half? The actual answer from our QSM research is no. At best, the, the most amount of schedule compression you get off of a 10-month project is a two-month acceleration to eight months. So you double staff and you might get 20% schedule. And finally, do bugs go down or do they go up? Do they go up by, say, double, triple, quadruple, or sixfold? And if you said, I bet they go up at least by quadruple, you'd be right. You'd also be right if you said, I think that they go up sixfold. Because what we see from the research is that for every doubling of staff, the communication complexity goes up by the square of the team size difference. So if you, if you double the staff by two, the defects go up at least by two squared, which is four. And we've seen them go up as high as six. So now instead of, say, 
250 bugs that you find and fix in the code, you might have to find and fix 1,000. You might have to find and fix 1,500 in a furious uh, you know, amount of testing at the 11th hour. And that's the contrast of an offshoring type of approach, which oftentimes leads to, hey, because we have less expensive people, let's throw them on the project. So if we were to have plotted their defects on this chart, which is defects or errors found during testing, we would see three red, dot, red dots, but I, there are no three red dots because as we got closer to testing, this client wound up canceling the project. So it started completely coming apart because not only were there double the people creating a lot of communication chaos, but there were onboarding issues and learning curve issues. And with each milestone slip, uh, the burden of money that was going out for 50, 60, 70, 90, 100, 200 people was enormous. And a $20 million endeavor was canceled, which would have been completely prevented if they weren't cost obsessed in the first place. Ironically, they wound up shooting themselves in the foot, losing a ton of money, and not getting a system. So that's the lessons learned. A defect spike in projects where we throw a huge number of people typically looks like this blue line compared to the industry average curve, which we can model in our slim model. We can scale up this model, say what curve is that actually riding, and then when we look out towards the tail end of that, we can actually see when does that tail of the curve come down far enough so that the code is ready to be shipped. And when we do that, we can often predict how long a project will overrun or slip. And in this example, like a GPS, we find out they're going to slip to a November date when the original target was July. And so that turned out to be a four-month slip because of the sheer weight of the number of bugs that they had to find and fix from a very aggressive ramp up with a large offshore team. And that's something that we see in our models very often time and time again. So as we come towards a, a wrap of the last few slides of this presentation, uh, what's the summary on this? Well, if I use the same one chart compared to industry, how did this project or an off project take? Well, 3.5 million industry average, the offshore project is about 3.2 million if it finishes. And these are for data that we pulled out of the QSM database that didn't get canceled and they finished uh, a little bit faster, 9.6 months instead of 12.6, again, because we're using a large team, and the average team for the sample that we pulled out in this mini research study was three people compared to 35. In terms of QA defects, we found that a sampling of these projects had almost triple the defects in the window that we looked at, so instead of 242 bugs in the code, that would have to be found and fixed during QA. There were 677. And mind you, if we think about how that contrasted to the Agile team, uh, which was 121, now you're talking about a difference of sixfold. So how does this stand up against, say, those co-located folks in Chicago at Follett Software? That's the Follett industry average again. So again, you'll see something interesting here. Follett's project performance in terms of cost was 1.3 million less than the industry average. The average offshore projects were only 0.3 million less. So when I said to the CEO and CFO, I said, if you dismantle your agile team here and you decide to just outsource it, it's actually going to cost you a million dollars more for every project you do. And the bugs will go up by sixfold. And so when they saw that data, they said, okay, that's it, we've heard enough. And that point, they actually doubled down from a quality perspective uh, on using Agile teams co-located in not only their Chicago region, but their Massachusetts offices and also their offices in South Carolina. So that's what happens when we get real factual data about defect behavior that really speaks to a principle that uh, Norbert Wiener had really put forth, and it was echoed by a Nobel Prize winning economist named Robert Lucas. He said there's a powerful force of concentration, clustering 
human creativity and talent. Those gains that come when smart and talented people co-locate in close proximity to one another. There's a productivity gain there and it happens because we're building clean code and we're not having to do it over and over again and call it refactoring. So, some practical advice and then we'll open it up for questions. What are some ideas? The source of our troubles oftentimes are the deadline. In the outsourcing case study, they said, make this date, throw the huge people, numbers of people on it, and in that case, the geometric impact of X going up by a factor of four or six with each doubling of staff killed them. So what might that tell us? Well, it might tell us maybe we should take a little more time because sometimes fast is slow and sometimes slow is fast. Don't get greedy. Build a little less. This is a fun puzzle that when my now 23-year-old daughter was five and six years old, she loved these puzzles. They're called 16 puzzles, right? And you rearrange the tiles to get them in order and align the, yellow, the whites with the reds and go from 1 through 15. What's the secret of being able to solve this puzzle? The answer is there's an open space. If there is no open space, you have nowhere to move around. And that applies to software backlogs. I'm going to say that when you build software, quality is inversely related to quantity. The more you try to pack in in a tight date, the more your bugs are going to climb. Back off a little less and give yourself room to move. If you find that you're along the way and you're ahead, well then maybe you can add some things into the backlog that are desired features as you get through, but don't overcommit from the beginning. I'd say the heart of all projects that I've seen fail is because they're already at 17 and 18 tiles when they really should be at 15. Large teams versus small teams. Small teams win. I'm showing my age. This is a television show called the A Team. But uh, we found from the Follett team size in terms of quality to the other companies' team size, small teams win. Give them the best tools. Don't go fall to victim of you know the pencil Nazis on cutting every single cost you can and not giving talented people what they need to work with. Um, that's going to kick up productivity in spades. So argue as much as you can for having the technology you need, whether it's a compiler or a tester or things like that, because it's going to be pennies compared to the amount of risk that comes to a project with buggy code. And finally, whether you're building medical systems, so I've worked with companies right now, one of my larger clients is building systems for embedded software in medical devices. Bugs mean that somebody could die. And so in cases like that, it's not just a bug, it's the safety and a possible loss of life. So, you know, what we're building in the context of the industry we're in really defines the kind of risks that we may be taking. You could be building systems that are dealing with the fact that we really do have an earth crisis. UN forecast suggests that uh, we're getting close to a collapse of 90% of the ocean fisheries. Um, my brother and sister live, sister-in-law live in Shanghai where the air looks like the upper left picture. Um, there was a huge recent spill in Colorado, I believe, on a coal mine that looks like the lower left picture. Uh, we're now seeing NASA images that uh, show that emissions from coal plants circulate around the entire planet. And lately we've been seeing unexplained fish kills where massive amounts of fish are just dying off. The technology that we are so good at, it may be called to help save the planet. You could be working in a field where we need to get off of fossil fuel and we need alternatives like wind and the software control systems for that, uh, or solar, 
which uh, we're trying to diminish our use of oil and fossil fuels. This is actually a picture of my son's solar field at the Putney School in Putney, Vermont. They have buildings that actually generate electricity and don't consume it. They're net positive, point zero. Follett Software is all about education. We're at 7.3 billion people and rising by about 150 million a week. The software and the clean code that you build could be about teaching the next generation of learners to solve all the problems that we're experiencing now in a world that's marching you know, close to seven and a half billion people. And some people think of software as the most important thing in the world because in the world of Gaia hypothesis, uh, Gaia theory, if you Google NASA's James Lovelock, people believe that we are actually creating the nervous system of the planet. And when you think about the fact that a text message from a phone in my pocket can reach at the speed of light to, you know, my cousin uh, uh, over in Europe traveling or my nephew in Shanghai and it gets to them within milliseconds or seconds, it's remarkable. We really are creating, with the information revolution, a wiring of the planet. So now we have uh, more data. Just as I wrap, we have agile trends. If those of you want to consider the idea of benchmarking your own trends, we have trends for schedule, effort, staffing, and defects. We pull the actual data off and we're left with trends. And now we're able to plot agile teams against agile trend lines on the QSM Slim desktop and find out are you above or below the line for time to market, staffing, effort, or bugs. So we're able to do that now. Uh, so that might be interesting if you're looking to make a quality case, whether Agile or Offshore, to your organization. Um, we use a metrics database, uh, software lifecycle management, or the words behind the SLIM model. If any of you are curious about articles pertaining to other case studies where we've used uh, these models to create these case studies, uh, feel free to get a hold of me. Um, all of the charts and a lot of the analysis that you saw today were done by these models. And they're not done just by me, but our client community, which uses them, puts all of this information on their desktop, can do exactly what I do, uh, getting numbers for a fact-based conversation. So we're able to answer the question, what about you? What about us? How do we stack up? What would our offshore projects look like. If we're trying to make a case and negotiate for another scenario, could we get data that makes a fact-based conversation uh, about ourselves so that we could, you know, maybe plot up our own trends and speak to our management and say, hey, we really know thyself. We're able to get numbers like this. It's not that hard. It's not rocket science. If you can see if a dot is above or below a center schedule line, that's what it takes, um, and we teach people how to do this to generate case studies like this. So I hope this has been extremely informative. Um, I have another article that I'm happy to send to you uh, along the themes of the title of this webinar is The World Not Flat, and it talks about some of the concepts that you saw in today's webinar feel free to shoot me an email or send me a Twitter message. My Twitter handle is at Michael C. Ma, M-A-H, and there's my contact information. And those are the two case studies for today's webinar. And now we can open it up to questions. We have a few minutes, about 13 minutes to go before we conclude the top of the hour. And I'd welcome not only just questions, but feel free to comment. What have you seen? What's it look like in your world? So Eric, how do we handle this phase? Do I turn it over to you? Uh, we'll just say, we'll wait just a couple seconds here uh, just to see if we have any questions. I don't see any questions uh, at the moment, but uh, let's, let's wait uh, a minute here and, and see if uh, anyone has a, a question or two. And one of the things that we could do if we need to is I could stoke with questions that I've been asked in the past, um, common questions that come when people are face-to-face. -face. So let's give people a few more moments, and then if not, I'll volunteer a question.
How about I volunteer one, Eric? Go right ahead, Michael. Okay. One well, of I, the common questions. Yeah. We, we do have one now. Okay. We'll let that person go. Uh, this person just had a comment, more so on trend lines. Uh, we use burn down C. Uh, uh, charts in the team foundation server to track sprints and PBIs. Uh, is that uh, in the same lines as uh, what you've shown? Um, yes, the answer is yes. Um, the things that are captured in Agile map exactly into things that we've been espousing to capture all along. So if you track burn up and you track burn down, that's the upward rise and the downward inverse fall of scope. So when we say a team finished this many story points in six months, that's the backlog. So we would look at that. Uh, if you track uh, in Team Foundation Server or anything that, or Rally or version one, also the end timeline for the number of sprints. We started in January, finished in April. We get our elapsed time. It may be four months, eight sprints. If you are also tracking the fact that you have uh, devs and testers and you've got uh, 12 people over a span of four months, we can get the person months of effort. It's 12 times four for each of the four months. If it's a 40-hour work week, we can get the hours. And so those are three out of the four metrics. And of course, the final fourth metric is bugs, bugs found in QA and regression. We don't really worry too much about bugs in the early part as the burn up is beginning. We really want to look at that last lap of the relay race before we go live and make sure we've got all the bugs checked out, cleaned, fixed before we hand it over to a customer if you deliver at the end of the lease. So good question to help clarify what metrics do we track because we track these. Does that fit with this? The answer is yes. And if you want to try that, shoot me an email, and I'll give you even a, a gratis complimentary mini-analysis, and we'll just keep it between ourselves. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Another person wanted to ask, uh, how, uh, how current is the industry information that was provided? Right up to the current day. We are just releasing a 9.0 of the Slim Suite of models, and our librarian uh, updates the information into the QSM database and as we roll in additional data, uh, 500, 1,000, however many projects in a batch that winds up being contributed by our client community anonymously, uh, names actually removed, no identification, they get folded into the trend lines and we actually remove the older data, put it on a shelf so we have a row rolling two to three year average. As we add new data, we remove the old, we update the trends, we put it to our website, our client community that's all part of our user base can download the latest trends and then they get it right on their desktop. We push it right to you. Wonderful. We have another question. Uh, they're asking, uh, any suggestions for organizations that are distributed worldwide and, uh, uh, but are, are trying to develop and test using agile practices? Good question. Um, Follett Software, the client that I mentioned here in this case study, they actually were forced to go that route by a new CEO that said, we're going to use global talent. We know we have a good co-located team, but uh, we're going to do it with using uh, you know, teams that are distributed as well. So it's kind of like agile slash offshore. Um, we get the data patterns there. Guess what? We found with each doubling of staff, defects wound up going up by a factor of four. Um, they were able to deliberately target a lot of the communication choke points. So, and in today's modern communication, you can get that shortening of the feedback loop, text messaging, video conferencing, things like that. You still can't quite overcome the fact that if it's eight o'clock at night over in you know, Bulgaria, you know, it's like, you know, noon here uh, in the East Coast or something like that. So we still struggle with time zones, which create a little bit of a problem. But there are attempts by people to say, hey, let's try and use an agile approach in a distributed, multi, uh, you know, multi-distributed, geographically dispersed team. 
what would your data look like? You would only know, or we would know if, if uh, we took a look at things like that, but there are companies that are facing that. Excellent question, because not sometimes not everybody we need is in Chicago or in Denver uh, or wherever we might be. Great. We have another question, Michael. Um, uh, one of the students wanted to know, what are, what are you finding uh, root causes uh, of defects? You mentioned communication, but what other root causes did you find? Good question. Um, you know, a lot of this work uh, was beautifully written out of AT&T and Bell, Bell Labs uh, back in the 80s and the 90s, and we look for what causal drivers are. I would say that, obviously, it's complexity, so we see uh, fewer bugs and stuff that's easy, right? Uh, domain knowledge, so if you have people that really know their stuff, bam, they get it right the first time, okay? Um, the degree of schedule pressure, which drives the team size, that certainly we see as a driver for defects. Um, you know, a number of things like that. I mean, if you take the purest ideal that, and now this is something that Steve Jobs did with the Macintosh team. I was watching Guy Kawasaki on a, uh, on a uh, video once. Uh, he was on the Macintosh team. I also read the, the biography. Uh, they had a team called the Texaco Towers that created the original Mac architecture, and it was a nondescript building that didn't have any identification markings, but it was near a Texaco gas station. And the philosophy on creating the Mac architecture was get the smartest people we know, put them in one place, and have them work on one thing, and give them all the support they need. And if you do that on software, you're going to get clean code. The farther away you go from those four things, you're going to get buggy code. So we actually have also seen code get buggy when teams are struggling with multitasking. Yeah, we're working on this project, but I have to work on three others and split my time and jump all over the place. And we see defects rise from multitasking as well. Excellent question. Thank you very much for that. Michael, we just have uh, one more question here. Uh, this person, uh, she, um, her company uses Agile for a growing number of projects, including offshore staff and multiple locations onshore. Uh, depending on how effectively and truly they embrace uh, the Agile model, they have tracked uh, success in improving quality and reducing timelines. She's just wondering, have you looked uh, at this uh, integrated model? Good. Okay. I think I get it. Thank you. Um, so. Some people would say, well, we call it Agile, but it's really water scrum, right? Um, so depending on the degree to which you're really adhering to Agile practices, I think you're also going to have a degree of success. So the degree to which you really give lip service or only give lip service to something, or if you really do effective release planning, if you really groom the backlog, if you really prioritize high-value features front, and then put lesser value features later and do iteration planning, track with iteration retrospectives with daily stand-ups, and then check in uh, watching your velocity and your code statistics with Sprint. If you do that really well, I think you're going to see faster schedules and lower bugs. We could find that out on the slim trend lines. If you just give lip service to it, I've also seen companies look just like every other crappy project, you know, and sometimes, quote, agile projects fail too because they say, ah, we're going to take the pick and choose approach. So uh, the, the answer to the question is, what is your day to day? And uh, give me a ring, shoot me an email, and I can give you a couple of shortcuts and tricks if you wanted to be able to frame that message. Wonderful, Michael. Well, that, uh, that is all the questions that we have. Wonderful. Well, uh, first, uh, I'd like to just uh, thank you again, Michael, and thank you to everyone for uh, attending today's uh, free webinar sponsored by IIST, the Leaders in Education-Based Certifications and Training. For more information on how IIST can help you or your organization, please visit www.iist.org. You can also follow IIST on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube to find out more information about IIST news, events, and promotions. Uh, thank you again, Michael. We really appreciate it. It was a wonderful webinar.
Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Eric. Have a great weekend. I know I was the man stand between you and lunch on a Friday as you head toward the weekend. Have fun and hope to see you out in San Diego for my keynote. And I'm teaching a tutorial on how to do exactly this kind of case studies, and that's going to be also out in San Diego. So see you in California. Thank you, Michael. Okay, thanks, Eric.